Oh, look, there's me. Yo, <laughs> right there. That's awesome. <laughs> you worked on episodes one and two of the prequels and the Matrix sequels. Wait, hold on. Wait, this is this is practical? The arena set itself, yeah, is practical. What? <laughs> I will tell you. <laughs> so I want to get your opinion on Star Wars and Star Trek. Oh, yeah, this is it. my favorite subject. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, welcome back to another episode of Visual, wait, no, Special Effects Artist React. That's right, we have a very special guest today. Adam Savage is on the couch with us. We have been looking forward to this all year. I'm so glad you were able to make it. Thanks for having me. We get a lot of requests for, for guests to be on, on the couch with us, and I'm pretty sure you are literally at the top wow. of, of the list. I mean, people are asking for Jackie Chan. Sure, sure. Sure, Jackie Chan's on there. <laughs> but that's almost another category. That's a different category. That, that, <laughs> it's apples and oranges. Wait, that's Nico? He's at the hospital right now. <laughs> Dude, Nico! Hey, what's Nico. up? <laughs> Dude, I, I wish you had a better work ethic, really, honestly. <laughs> you know, all the days that uh, my new baby would arrive, today's the day. Dude, what a thank pleasure. You. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I, you too. Yeah, good Let luck. Go. How intense was that? All right. <laughs> I'm picturing his wife just behind the camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Adam, a lot of people know you from Mythbusters, of course, but you have a rich history and experience building things for movies. So I would love to hear some of your insights about the special craftsmanship that makes movies that we love possible. Awesome, I love this subject. You worked on episodes one and two of the prequels. You're correct. Back when everything was Back when we thought they were gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna say that. Look, I look back on those prequels very, very fondly after all the new movies. Mm -hmm. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> fair point. Tough but fair. So I came in late in production on episode one. Okay. Look, I saw Star Wars when it came out. I was 10 years old and it changed my life. And so I had been, I'd worked in special effects and commercials and theater for a decade, a decade and a half before I decided it's time to go up to ILM. I, I gotta be able to leverage this to get it. Yeah. And so I ended up calling the, the manager of the model shop, Mark Anderson, about once a week for several months. I mean, I was cheeky, but I also knew that like, I knew at that point in my career I was qualified. And Mark eventually brought me in and I got to spend the last six months of episode one's production. So I only worked on Newt and Rune's shuttle and a few okay. other small models. Larry Tan had done most of the, the fabrication and I came in to do the detailing with him. And then he moved on to another gig. And at that point, Doug Chang trusted me enough. So I got to dress the bottom, paint the whole model, dress the inside of the loading bay, and then put in the lighting and wire up all the lighting and then rig it on set while Marty Rosenberg shot it. It was like, it was like a absolute bucket list set of operations for this one <laughs> spaceship. And this is the last movie, episode one, it was the last Lucasfilm movie in which all the ships are practical. All the ships were modeled, almost wow. all the ships. At least there like were that. practical models of every ship. I mean, I remember spending a weekend covering the queen ship with mylar, the chrome queen ship, yeah. covering an eight foot fiberglass model of the queen ship with mylar, which we had to like push yeah, I, and uh, stretch to get it to move between every panel line to have oh, perfect man. stretches of it. The irony being that like, that's easy to do in CG right? these days. Right, <laughs> All three of the prequels are absolutely beautiful. <laughs> They are. I mean, if anything, my issues with them visually are that episode episode one is almost too busy. Like they had all the toys and they put them in every frame and it was episode two where every shot started to feel like an actual Ralph McQuarrie painting. Lucas, since the beginning days, has relied on uh, incredible visual artists like Ralph McQuarrie and now Doug Chang to visualize so much of this world, not just piecemeal, but cohesively. And Ralph McQuarrie helped George sell the film with an incredible set of paintings. And there's a, there is a depth and a, and a veracity to those paintings. And special effects took a long time to catch up to the majesty of those paintings, in yeah. my opinion. But by episode two, there, like every single shot looked exactly like an actual Ralph McQuarrie painting. He, he developed this whole aesthetic for the whole style of Star Wars. Very just like a grungy style of ships and whatnot. There's 
so many parts to that lineage. Grant McCune did the earliest okay, prototype fair. models. He did some beautiful work. Ralph McQuarrie's drawings show these ships as used and worn out. And then I've had long talks with Lauren Peterson, who's worked on since Star Wars, and he talked about that they called it boilerplate. That basically every Greebly has a purpose, and if the model maker has an understanding of what that purpose is, it's going to sell. Okay. And so that just like that was my earliest understanding that everyone below the director is also telling stories. I built the the building in Topoka City that uh, Obi Wan and Django have their fight on in Episode Two. Oh yeah. So the whole building behind them is actually also a practical model that I built. Man. So I see all of these details I labored over, and it's like I'm putting three things together on the side of the Topoka City Master Building, and I'm like. These are cooling vents, and that's why this one's missing because something hit it, and now there's a rust streak. And like, I have a narrative in my head, and it doesn't work unless I do. I love that. That's oh really my cool. Goodness. Mark Siegel and I built the first arena for episode two. We built the first model of the arena so George could see it in 3D. And we built a foam core model that I think was about three feet okay. wide. And in sections so that George can go, okay, great, we're going to put a thing over here and maybe we need a better entrance of, you know, it's to have that discussion be in 3D space. They, they made maquettes. You built a, like a prototype there, yeah. but then the actual final arena was also like a big... It was a huge set. It was about oh. eight, six, eight feet in diameter. Wait, hold on. The, the, this is, wait, this is, this is practical? The arena set itself, yeah, is practical. I, I'm, I'm just trying to take that in. It, it's about eight feet in diameter, I think. Eight, wow. nine feet in diameter. <laughs> What? <laughs> I will tell you. <laughs> there, that's the miniature behind them. Like whenever you see the arena in the distance, that's shot practically on a motion control stage, getting shots of the arena to use as background set extensions. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Yeah. So I've spent. I mean, those were those were rough shoots because where you're shown a rough CG breakdown of what the action is going to be, and frequently you'll see that detail show up on the right. That might be like Marty Rosenberg, one of the main cameramen for the motion control stuff, being like, okay, for this pullout, I want something in the foreground. So could someone run to the model shop and make me some rocks or go grab some rocks from the Beggar Canyon set and let's stick them on a C stand up close to the camera. So when the camera pulls out, we get this foreground stuff. That's amazing. But then you still get that unified lighting. So mm -hmm. it looks like it's part of the scene. Yeah, absolutely. I will tell you, I've been on a motion control stage with Marty Rosenberg shooting when the camera's moving and we're watching the camera move and he's like, that's that spot looks too blank. And we'll go in while the camera's set up, and they'll put a tarp over it and we'll airbrush extra panels for that one shot. Oh, absolutely. We're sculpting wow. these shots piece by piece, frame by frame. Because on the Droid Factory, man, I ran back to the model shop like three or four times to build whole models in a matter of a couple of hours to get them Dang. into the set. Yes. Months and months and months just setting up different conveyor belts for different shots and adding little details in frame. So I want to get your opinion on sort of like the aesthetics between Star Wars and Star Trek. Oh, yeah, this is my favorite subject. Let's do this. Because it's like, <laughs> you know, they seem kind of similar. Sure. They share four letter words and uh, Com they're not at all the completely same. Different. <laughs> I remember a day I'm sitting there and my mentor, Mitch Romanowski, who ran the shop and Fawn Davis, who runs Fonco here, right. were all working across the table from each other and Mitch was working on a Star Trek model and Fawn and I were working on Star Wars models and Mitch was like, why isn't this detail working here? And Fawn and I, we were younger than Mitch by about 10 or 12 years, so okay. we're much more invested <laughs> in the difference between Star Trek and Star Wars than Mitch. Uh -huh. And so we engendered a day-long conversation. And the thing is, is that Star Trek is a utopia. Yes, yes. Star Trek is a utopia it's an and Star Wars feature. is a dystopia. They're literally opposites. Yeah. And so while the ships have details and they utilize lots of the same modeling techniques, on Star Trek, what you'll see is physical details that are bilaterally symmetrical, which is often in Star Wars, but not truly bilaterally symmetrical. There'll be like five things in a row. There's never five details in a row that are all the same on a Star Wars ship. Yeah, there's always three, and then there's a blank spot where there's a rust streak, and then there's a gotcha, different yeah. one, right? Yeah. Because the, the narrative in Star Wars is we're still working on these things. We're trying to make them work. We don't have enough resources. Everybody's fighting over the resources. That's oh, kind true, of the yeah. inherent aesthetic of all of these ships. Yeah. The Star Trek ships, like you can't have a piece missing unless you're dealing with an alien race in which there's a scarcity model. Yeah, I mean, they, everyone has a replicator. Jesus, right? You can have anything you want. You hit the button on the replicator. 
Yeah. Every, anything you want comes out. Um, one of the best techniques in Star Trek ships is what's called specular highlighting. Yeah. So what you're seeing there on the side of that ship is a final painting pass of matte, semi-gloss, and gloss uh, uh, friskets, uh, laser cut friskets of paneling that the painters, after they've done all the panel detail, after they've done all the weathering, they then, la the laser cutters, we'd cut them these vinyl friskets of just random patterns and they would lay them on and do a semi-gloss and pull it oh, off. Lay yes. them on and do a gloss and yes. pull it off. And just the overlapping of that adds tons more detail. And then they do a final pass with pencils. If you look really up close at the five footer that's here in LA, you'll see tons of pencil work on it. The Star Trek ships benefit from specular highlighting much more because they have much less uh, physical detailing. They tend to have wider swaths of flat, broken by windows, but still topographically um, pretty uniform. So you have to break that up with painting. Otherwise, it, there's no scale to it. And it's all about the scale. Everything we're talking about is about adding scale. This thing is the size of like hundreds of Empire State Buildings glued together, yeah. right? Like, we, it's still even hard for us to conceive how big the Star Trek ships are. But like, I guess that's the thing too, even like, you know, we're, we're sitting here, we try and make like a 3D model, and it's the weirdest thing ever. You have this huge thing, you hit render, and if it's totally smooth, like, it, it looks fake. You know what I'm saying? Look like, at the containers falling off the container ship in Perfect Storm. There's a container ship that's entirely CG, and it's okay. beautiful, but everything is flat. And there's not enough, there's not enough physical detail breaking up the scale of the containers. Uh, and that's just early CG. That's like, yeah. that's also early CG modelers not having the same institutional knowledge about selling scale. Oh, hello there. It's Ren from the future. If you're enjoying this episode, Adam's got a lot more cool stuff to say on the website, quarterdigital.com, because we've got extended editions of these episodes dropping every single Saturday. Quarterdigital.com. Sign up now, get a two-week trial, and get everything that we put out, including a 15% off all of our merchandise, access to all of our exclusive shows like Crew Cuts, Son of a Dungeon, Functional Filmmaking. It's great, and the future is looking bright. I highly recommend getting a subscription. Also, it's available on iOS and Android. Get the apps. They're available in the app getting places. <laughs> so you worked on the Matrix sequels. I did. That, I mean, <laughs> I feel like the Matrix sequels, they get a bit of a bad rap, but like, I was a fan of them when they came out, and I, I still think there are a lot of aspects from those movies that really, really work. Now, you did a lot of the model work from Reloaded and Revolutions. Yeah, they were shot simultaneously. Oh, that's right. And so we did the effects also simultaneously out on Treasure Island. Mannix, the effects company, built a huge sound stage where they had the the Zion party. Yeah. That 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 was an eleven thousand square foot room. Wow. <laughs> um, that in World War II was filled with uh, Mustangs. The, the Mustang the, planes. The airplanes. Yeah. And then we set up a huge motion control stage for the dock. So when they come into the dock, yes. a good portion of that set is practical. It's so that now. whole set there, that all of that, the columnar up to the crane with the, with all the moving gears, all that was practical. So Owen Patterson is the production designer okay. of, of Matrix and like he is one of my all-time heroes and I got to work in an office with him for a year and it was great. Just below the crane you see what looks like a mesh frame. Above that you see the mesh frame. That's an escapement inside of which are the gears for the elevator that brings you up to the dock. Mm. And so I did this whole gear arrangement. And so like three days later, I come, oh, and look at this. And I turn it and all these things turn. And he goes, stop, stop, stop. And I'm like, what? And he's like, don't show the Wachowskis that it moves. They will want it to move in shot and that'll ruin our lives. Oh my God. <laughs> he's like, glue it, glue it down. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, what is it like, no, like, no, 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 no. We don't have time or money to do that. So this dude, crane the crane falling. falling. Yep, that was. They blew up your crane, that dude. That was a crane. Well, see, you're making an assumption that when you build it to be destroyed, being destroyed is the end of your mission. Building something to be destroyed is its own science and art. And you put structure in it. You use aluminum foil. You use breakaway plasters, foam that you'd spray paint in silver, so silver chunks are flying out of it when it <laughs> blows up. You're literally attempting 
to build something that looks great at 250 frames per second when they yeah, ramp it up. Yeah, because you would have to yep. shoot it so slow-mo for something of that size yep. to fall at the correct speed. Exactly. So you don't, not only don't you mind it blowing up, blowing, you making four in order so that you can blow up. And maybe hopefully the last one doesn't get blown up. <laughs> I know for uh, the Rocketeer, um, John Goodson built the blimp for the Rocketeer. And when they were doing the blimp explosion, he kept on saying, you should be paying me to make two blimps. And they're like, we don't have the money. And he's like, you should be paying me to make two blimps. It's only a little bit more expensive to make two. And they messed up the first shot of the blimp explosion and they had to build a second one. And now yeah. that he wasn't able to make them in parallel, it cost more. Yeah, it was a worse more. problem. Not enough money to do it right, but plenty of money to do it twice. So back to the crane though. Obviously the destruction was planned, but it also looks like even the way it falls was planned. And, and specifically, like the Wachowskis are like, okay, we want it to hit here and crush there and then tumble down. So it's not just like you push it off a stalk. Like they have a whole narrative of how they want this fall to look and effects has to make it work. So you see some cables on it. Those are all about lowering it at, at speed correctly for camera. Sure, okay. So there's a shot towards the end of Revolutions where, you know, Zion is about to be overwhelmed by the Sentinels and they're coming to the rescue, you know, Morpheus is in tow in the passenger seat and the kid's got to come and open the door. He's the last hope of humanity, literally here. And then the, the ship comes blasting through the doors. That was a practical shot involving a 15 foot long fiberglass Mjolnir shaped buck. I always want to call them Mjolnir because that's what we called it on set. Oh, really? Okay, yeah, sure. It was officially the Mjolnir until they were close to release. Dang, okay. And now everyone knows Mjolnir as Thor's hammer, but back then that was a deep cut. That, of, that was of, like the nerdiest That was names. a prime nerd drop when you like <laughs> laid that one down. When someone said, what's Thor's hammer? And you went, Mjolnir. And everyone was like, hmm, maybe an idiot. <laughs> um, and the doors were built out of lead, what? sheet, and balsa so that they would tear apart correctly oh. in scale when they got hit at 40 miles an hour by this cable That's pulled. Something. So what I'm hearing in my head watching this is fire in the hole, because we heard fire in the hole for months. <laughs> Because they really? just were testing explosives or doing okay. shots, and every single time you did, somebody had to yell fire in the hole. Okay. That looks really good. Yeah. So again, realize that they're timing a pyrotechnic effect to blow flames out of the door enough that you see them, but not so much that they wash out the shot. And then you start to think about how to expose for that crap, and like the coordination between departments gets really heavy. I, I noticed actually they even have uh, like the, some, some different chemicals going on with mm -hmm. the, the flame effects to get the, the blue. Because uh, I, so I noticed that in the final shot too, it's like you, 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 the, the blue fire that's coming right. out of it. Yeah. And I know that you obviously can like tint that sometimes, but it seems like they're, they have actually achieved it there. Different special sauces. Yeah. <laughs> Look, there's me showing up in behind oh, the scenes. Yo, <laughs> right there. That's awesome. <laughs> that was Troy yeah. Valichi on the right. The, really? Yeah. There he is. Oh, yeah, no way. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> this is real memory lane for me. Yeah, I'm sure this is just like a nostalgia trip for it's you right wonderful. now. wonderful. My, my goodness. <laughs> my God. Adam, thank you so much for coming here today. Yeah. Like, I... I knew I was going to have fun. I didn't know I was going to have this much fun. So well, I really appreciate it. I mean, yeah, same, <laughs> same. It was a bit of a bit of a wrench thrown in the gears with Nico having a baby this morning, oh, but like surprise, and that's that's the reveal me, in the episode. Me, me, me. <laughs> yeah, how, how, yeah, Nico. So my only question after all of this talking is, when can I come back? I, I mean, <laughs> any time. I, mean, you... I would love to come back. We should figure out some other things to talk about because this is this my whole life is this discussion. You you have a whole YouTube channel that I've been a fan of for years. <laughs> uh, I mean, did fame in reverse. I started as a television star, then I became a YouTuber. I'm just trying a different model. <laughs> yeah. So check out Tested. Links in the description. It's a very fun YouTube channel. I love the sort of like one day builds that you have. We're like, I'm gonna make a thing. We're just gonna do it all day. There's so much, so much cool stuff on there. Go check it out right now.